Please open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. My name is Leke Lebu. Come on. Uh, I serve in the campus ministry. It's awesome being a disciple of Jesus. Uh, the past month, to catch you guys up, uh, if you are visiting, if this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, we're, we're so glad that you're here. We have a Spanish service in the fellowship hall, uh, worshiping as well. Um, so, we're in 1 John 3, but it says Romans chapter 12, because this, these first two months, we've been focused on worshiping in His presence. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we understand that worship isn't just singing to God, but it's our lives. That's right. Yeah. Worship isn't merely just singing, but it's the way we walk day to day. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So what, what, what's our goals this year? What are our goals this year? Well, our theme is in His presence. We want to live in the presence of God every single step. We want to be in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, our goal this year is, one, to get deeper, Amen. deeper in our relationship with God. So as a church, we can ask ourselves each month, each day, man, do I feel deep with God? Amen. And by, at the end of the year, we can say, man, did I get deeper with God? I love that we have direction. Mm -hmm. Amen. And number two, just growing in our zeal to serve Jesus. And we'll, you know, we'll re-emphasize this theme and these goals to see where we're at. Uh, the past month, two months, uh, we, we've talked about life in His presence, and Steve blew it out starting off the year. Uh, Chris killed it talking about worship in His, uh, in, in spirit and truth. Um, no Chris, man. Uh, power of worship uh, from Jaja Bittencourt, which was from Brazil. He was awesome. He was just like before us, speaking so elegantly, and we were all enamored by not only his accent, but the way that he shared the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being thankful. One of the sisters said Sean, Bounce, Sean Barnes, Bounce, Sean Barnes sounded like Martin Luther King. <laughs> so, I heard Martin Luther King today. <laughs> I was like, that was Sean Barnes. James <laughs> um, it. Uh, worship no other gods. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone was convicted. Yeah. Everyone left thinking, man, God, God alone, only God, only God, God alone. Mm. And we sang it today just so we remind ourselves that there are no other gods that we worship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was John. And then James, Come on. JC, Come on, James yeah. Campbell, Come on. talked about reverence and awe yeah. and God taking over. Yeah. Yeah. So we understand that worship is us living in the presence of God. It's our lives. You know, the religious world, we put, you know, sometimes we put words in a box. This word grace, you know, the word grace biblically, it's almost a force moving us, compelled by God's great love that changes our lives. Grace, according to Jude 4, it's not a license to sin. Mm -hmm. Grace isn't like, oh, I have grace, I have cheap grace, so I can just sin. You know, sometimes we put grace in a box. Mm -hmm. And the religious world is like, yeah, I can, I can sin because I have grace. Paul says, by no means. Mm -hmm. You know, so even in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, you know, I worked hard, but it wasn't me. It was God's grace. Amen. Titus says, God's grace teaches us. It's like a force that's teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. And to live self-controlled, upright lives in this present age. Grace is awesome, if we understand it biblically. Another word, worship. <clears throat> worship. When you hear worship, most people think just music worship. Or singing. Well, worship is getting on your face. Being close to God. You know, I, I think another word that we put in a box is this word pure. <laughs> Even me saying that. How's your purity, bro? What am I talking about? 
talking about? <laughs> Sexual purity. <laughs> but purity is so much greater than that. It's not just sexual purity. We should ask the question. Uh, I shared this in the campus ministry, and I asked Nathan uh, like two weeks later. I was like, "Bro, how's your purity?" And he said, "What do you mean? <laughs> because purity's not in a box. <laughs> purity is it sexual? You talking about sexual purity? Bro, I'm fired up. Are you talking about my heart?" You know, so we need to kind of take this, this word purity out. And even when, when we go to conferences and we see purity class, what are we talking about? Sexual purity. But the scriptures are such, it, it's, it's amazing, it's beautiful, scripturally, what God says about purity. So as we move along, and as we close uh, just worship in His presence, the next few months is going to be minister in His presence. Minister in it in his presence. Yeah. Let's move along really just with this view of purity. Come on, bro. Today's lesson is titled Purity is Power. Purity is power. It's powerful to be a pure person. Let's look at what 1 John chapter 3 says here. Come on, Lex. Starting in verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Yeah. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Yeah. Let's start right there. I have one question, two points, and five practices. Mm, come on. Here's the first question. Do you hear the sound of the alarm? My first point, God is pure. My second point, purity is power. If you're a note taker, or if you're taking pictures like Erica and Chris, they're both married, but they're both taking pictures on the sofa right now. <laughs> Those are the scriptures. He got that for me, bro. Amen. First John chapter 3. Going on in verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know, there's a book um, written by uh, F. Lagarde Smith, and he talks about this concept, uh, and the book is called, Who is My Brother? And it's reconciling that people in this world are our brothers and our sisters. <laughs> if we look at Luke 15, we see that people that are lost are still our brothers and our sisters. And this passage, it's so beautiful because it says that those who are disciples, they are children of God and one day will be transformed. But I have a question. Do you hear the sound of the alarm? Do you see how our world is thinking and feeling? You know, divorce rates are 45 to 50 percent in the United States. And if you divorce and get remarried, your chances of staying married is 30%. Yeah. 30 to 40%. And then if you divorce and get remarried again, your chances are even lower. Yeah. People are hungering for God, and they don't even know it. That's right. They're trying to understand, what is this marriage thing? But divorce is random. When we think of suicide, so many college students think about this because of the pressures of this world, because of the pressures of their parents to perform, to do great, because of seeking to get that A. Suicide. Do you hear the sound of the alarm? And 
when I, I, you know, I majored in Portuguese and sociology, two bachelors with one in sociology, one in Portuguese. The one in sociology, we had a class on Weber, Marx Weber and Durkheim. And one of the studies that, that I, I was just fixed on was Durkheim's, Emil Durkheim's study on suicide. And one of the things that he said, that people see themselves as not valuable, they're invaluable to society. So what they do is they step back. They separate themselves from society and then they start having thoughts like, I'm not valuable. They don't know the passage in Matthew 6 where it says, God sees us as valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't know that, but they step away from society. And what Marx also says is this word alienation. We're being alienated from the person maybe that we're working with or the next person. And there's not this communal connection that is so beautiful in Genesis 1. Two, people are being alienated. And a large part, parents, is because we give our kids this, instead of sitting down with them and teaching them this is what it means to be a person. Amen. They're learning through this. If you have Snapchat, if you have Facebook, if you have Instagram, most likely your kids have watched porn or are being seduced to do that every single day. Yeah. Every single day, I get a friend request of someone wanting to have sex with me. Yeah. Yeah. I was even joking with the sisters, I'm like, should I add her? And they're like, who's that? And then I scroll down, they're like, no bro, of course you shouldn't add her. Yeah. But people are being alienated from actually communicating with society. Yeah. Fellowship is not sexing someone else somewhere else. Yeah. Sex, oh man, this is huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. In society, everyone's talking about it. Even little kids, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. everyone's talking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We understand that even uh, uh, sex is seen as idolatry and, and, and just not even, not even necessarily the action but the idea. Right. How about the unsaved? One of my friends, uh, we, were, we, were, we were in the car going to Melissa's birthday party. She just turned 17. <laughs> she turned 20. And Melissa, on, on the way to Melissa's birthday party, my friend said, man, my, my friend just died. I don't feel good. And then I drove home on campus, and then he said, man, I have some questions. This is the question he asked me. My friend that just died, like, do you think he's going to heaven or hell? Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. You really get it when someone dies. Yeah. But are we hearing the sound of the alarm every single day? Mm -hmm. Do we hear the sound of the alarm? Do we have to wait till someone perishes for us to say, wow, they need God? Mm. People are thirsting for a purpose. People are becoming nuns. I spoke about this in ETS. Nuns are those who say, oh no, I'm not affiliated with anything. You know, laws are seeking to, you know, bring in some type of morality. And more and more people are becoming atheists, not having, uh, you know, the moral law that God has given us. And more and more people are becoming atheists or agnostic, at least in the U.S. In other countries, religion has grown. But people are looking for some purpose, something to live for. People are hunger, hungry and thirsty. But do we hear the sound of the alarm? People are starving for God. Here's the answer in 1 John 3, verse 3. Amen. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Amen. You know, one thing I love about 1 John is that in chapter 1, it talks about God is light. In Him there's no darkness. I've been studying apologetics and one of the things that uh, just move me is this understanding 
of God's nature. Everyone wants God. The biblical God, the nature of God, everyone wants it. You know, everyone wants truth. Everyone doesn't want, you know, someone just lying to them all the time. The Bible says in 1 John 1 that God is light. In 1 John 2, it says God is righteous. You know, when was the last time you were like, just bring it on, deceit. Mm. Bring it on. I, that's what I want for my life. No one wants that. Everyone wants someone that's righteous in their lives. Mm. That's God. Everyone is seeking God, the nature of God, if they know it or if they don't. And what does it say in 1 John 3? That God is pure. Yep. Amen. Everyone loves purity, even if they know it or not. Everyone loves purity even if they know it or not. Think about it. God, His nature is pure. We read a lot of, a lot of scriptures to seekers who say, you know, Jeremiah 29. What does that say? You know, God's motives aren't evil. They're pure. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to do awesome. John 3.16, the greatest passage in the United States. <laughs> God loves you. He loves the world. He loves everyone. He wants everyone to be saved. Amen. What are God's motives? The Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is seeking the nature of God even if they don't know it. Come on. Amen. Come on, okay. We can show them who God is. Amen. Come on, bro. So God is pure. The answer. Do we hear the sound of the alarm? The answer is God. What's another apology for you know this world? Jesus. Jesus is pure. Let's look at what Hebrews chapter 7 says. Amen. Amen. Come on, Lekhe. I shared some of these things with the staff, and I just kept talking, just throwing out a bunch of different passages. And as soon as I said, Jesus is pure, Steve went into a trance. <laughs> he sat there in the corner, just like this. <laughs> and then after everything was done, he said, bro, I didn't hear anything else you said. All I thought was that Jesus is pure. Amen. All I thought was that Jesus is pure. You know, how about Jesus with women? Remember his encounter in John chapter 4? With the Samaritan woman? Jesus wasn't racist. She said, well, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. Jesus just kept on going with the conversation. We're in society, it was, it was weird for this, <laughs> this to happen that Jesus wasn't sexist. You know, in the Gospels, in John 11, he, he cried. Who was around? Women. Not saying that there's a correlation between a lot of women crying, but I'm just saying that's where Jesus is crying. <laughs> in John chapter 8, Jesus defended women. How awesome. Sometimes people say, Christianity, you guys are against women. <laughs> I don't know what Bible you're reading, but if you read about Jesus, just read John chapter 8, read Luke 7. Jesus is defending the cause of the widow, the cause of women. There wouldn't be a woman's day if people read the Bible. And then the Passion account. I don't know if you've ever been crucified, but it hurts. It was so gruesome that even in the Bible, it just mentions he was crucified. To explain the details, some of you wouldn't even read that part of the Bible. And on the cross, what does Jesus do? He says, John, take care of Mary. We love Jesus because he's pure. Look at what Hebrews 7 says. Starting... In verse 22. You guys with me? Yeah. Amen. Alright. Because of this oath, 
Hebrews 7, 22. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Amen. Now we can eat bacon. Verse 23. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing the office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who have come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Amen. Why, why is that? Because Jesus was a pure lamb. Why can he intercede? Because not only did he rise again, but the reason that we have such confidence in the cross for our salvation is because Jesus was pure. Yeah. And look at what it says, verse 26, we didn't even get to it. Such a high priest truly meets our need. Do you hear the sound of the alarm? The hungry world. He meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Yeah. Jesus, being God, is pure. Jesus with the Pharisees. What is he doing? He's purifying the motives. He's checking where your heart's at. Jesus with Nathaniel, when he meets Nathaniel, he says, that guy is a true Israelite. And Nathaniel's like, yeah, you know me, Jesus. You're the son of God. And Jesus is like, wow, do you believe me now? Watch what I'm going to do. And then he walked with Jesus. Jesus in the crowds. Anytime there's a huge crowd, you know what Jesus does? He preaches the hardest sermon. Why? So he can check whose hearts are pure. Amen. Is that how we feel when we hear of our sermons? Jesus preached in parables. Why? So he can see if people were purely following him and doing their homework, or if they were just there for the food. Some of us, some disciples, some Christians, if it wasn't for the fellowship, if it wasn't for the food, if it wasn't for the fun, would you be a Christian? Talk about it. Is Jesus the reason that we're here? If Jesus, is Jesus the reason that we desire to be pure? And I don't mean sexual purity, I mean every single thing in the presence of God. Is Jesus the reason for us living our lives today? Jesus and John the Baptist, John the Baptist says, guys, that guy, that guy right there, he's, he's the, the Lamb of God. You know what happened? John's disciples left him. He's like, all right, man, peace. I'm going to Jesus because he's pure. Even at Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist is like, I need to be baptized by you. Because you understand the purity of Jesus. No, man. God is pure. Jesus is pure. We must love purity. We must love the heart of what it means to be pure. And again, I do not mean sexual purity. I mean every single area of our lives. Come on, man. Really getting in there, seeing where we're at. Seeing if our moment-to-moment, -moment, day to day motives are pure. Point number two. Purity is power. Amen. Purity is power. If we have the courage to take purity out of the box and say, I'm going to be pure, I commit to being pure every single day of my life. Not leaving our prayers, our morning prayers, saying, Amen, without a God, I pray that I live a powerful life today. That in every moment, today, God, I want to be pure. That my thoughts, my feelings, the way I walk today, that I see purity as powerful. You know, purity is a disparaging term. It's a pejorative term. 
in society. If young people say, you know, I'm a virgin, their friends are like, <laughs> you're weird, dude. You haven't got any? Talk about it. If people say that I dress this way because I don't want other people to struggle over me, they say what? Yeah. You know, we're high schoolers. Yeah. Jesus, there's, there's no account of Jesus being cool. But just read his life. He was the coolest dude walking around. Yeah. Your kids are scared of being pure because they won't be accepted. Yeah. But they don't know that purity is power. Yeah. College students, this is an interesting topic because if you say, man, I'm doing this because of God, you're seen as prude, yep. weird. Yep. Now that person is uh, interesting. <laughs> He's a Christian. I was talking to one of the brothers. He said, I'm not 21 yet, so I don't drink. He was talking to uh, his coworker, and he said, I don't drink because I'm a Christian. And then she said, a lot of Christians. <laughs> and so what he's saying, he's saying, I follow the scriptures. And she said, what are you talking about Leviticus? Like where it talks about killing people? He said, no, actually Jesus said it. The New Testament. What? Purity. You know, I love it because even people are attracted to purity. When they put down the facade of who they really are, people love purity. Yep. I remember evangelizing on campus with uh, Norman, and come on, Norman. and we were reaching out to this girl, and she just came from the library. I shared this as well in the equipping the saints class, and she had all her different arguments. I said, "Hey, do you believe in God?" And she said, "Well, I, I have my questions." And I love that. I was like, all right, <laughs> I can test out what I've been reading. All right. Did, so why don't you believe in God? Anytime someone says I don't believe in God or the question, I just say why. Even if I don't know the answers, I'll just learn yeah. what society is really thinking. So I said why. And then she asked about different things about the Bible that she didn't know. And then I was like, I have an answer. <laughs> and then she asked another question. And then because I answered that one, she jumped to another question. I said, no, 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 let's, let's stick on this one. And then at the end of it all, she basically said, okay, okay, fine. So you're telling me, if you had a girlfriend, you would sleep with her? I responded as a godly man in victory. <laughs> We're going to start believing, you know, let's just accept the term man or male and let's just not, let's just use another pronoun or, you know, just say he or something or, or it or I'm a whatever. You know what, she, what, what happened when I said that? I was like, well, I'm not going to take advantage over some, some girl. She's not my wife. I want her to have confidence in me. She said, wow. I've never heard anyone say that. Yeah. Purity is attractive. Yeah. Come on, bro. And then she started opening up. She said, wow, you know, I just came to the library crying because my boyfriend and I, we just broke up. She was able to open up because she saw my motives weren't after her. Yeah. Yeah. Purity is powerful. Yeah. You know, even in the scriptures, purity, purity is power. Purity is an example of winning souls. 1 Peter 3, in verse 2, it says, When they see the purity and the reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or Gucci, I mean, fine clothes. <laughs> Rather, it should be that of your inner 
Amen. The purity, the unfading beauty of the gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in the presence, in the sight of God. Amen. Amen. For this is why, this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. How? With purity. They submitted themselves to their own to their own husbands, like Sarah, who disobeyed Abraham and who obeyed, sorry. Come on. That's not what the scripture said. Like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and Amen. called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not be away. I think the reason that purity isn't seen as powerful because of that last concept of fear. Yeah. We're scared to be pure, we're scared to stand up because we're scared of what people are going to think. Mm -hmm. And the context is talking to married women that by your example of purity, by the way you adorn yourself, by your inner self, you're going to win your husband's over. The example of purity. Even in our fellowship, or just a fellowship, 1 Corinthians 14, 25. As the secrets of their hearts are laid bare, so they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. In the context here is a worship service. What is it saying? When Christians are engaged, they come to learn a new revelation. They give and they serve and they see the purity of each and every life. Amen. Whoever comes in, they're going to be moved. You know what irks me? Is when people say, you know, we used to do that in the past. We used to be excited about bringing friends to service because if they saw the fellowship, if they saw the true disciples here, they would be moved. Are you still excited to bring out your friends? Come on, Lek. Are you seeking to be engaged, learning to go out and share the word? Yeah. Are you like, I have to bring a friend today. I have to bring a friend so they can hear the word of God, they can hear the singing, and they can get awesome hugs. <laughs> Are you still fired up about that? Amen. Or has it been years since you even sought to bring a visitor out? Oh, like you're talking about evangelism, we're talking about purity. Purity is the way you live. Yeah. There was a brother in Virginia. He was feeling sad, not only sad, but he found out that his wife was cheating on him. And the crazy thing is, part of the reason was because he was cheating on his wife. And what happened was that he decided that he was going to kill himself. But first, he was going to kill his wife. So he went out to grab a gun, bought one, and he said, you know, I think it would be a good idea for me to go to Neighborhood Bible Talk, just so people would understand that I was the righteous guy in the relationship. So he brought his wife that Neighborhood Bible Talk, and it was awesome. The person leading the, <laughs> leading the Bible talk, I think it was an elder in the church and in Virginia, and he turned off the lights and read John chapter 3. He said, you know, and, and he read the passage where he talks about those who live in darkness, they don't want to be exposed. They turn on the light, he was solid. He reached out to the guy who was leading the Bible talk. He said, dude, this is what I was going to do. They heard the sound of the alarm. He said, man, I'm going to turn in my gun to you because he was a police officer. <laughs> and he said, man, I want to study the Bible. I want to know what this is about. So he studied the Bible. He became a Christian. His wife became a Christian. And now they're disciples in the church in Virginia. Amen. 
When people are brought to a Bible talks, when people are brought to events, are you excited to give your heart, to serve, to be engaged? Or do you say, man, I've heard that scripture before. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not that purity. There's not that, I desire God. Come on. Mm. So that people get on their knees and say, wow, God is really among you guys. Let's look at James chapter 3. Purity is power. James is to the right. I went to the left first. Purity is power because it's the standard of heaven. In James chapter 3, starting in verse 13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by their deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. You know, some of us are buying into the world's wisdom. Where the scriptures are saying here, verse 13, show it by the way you live. Verse 14, you know, this, this ambition in your heart, this selfish ambition in your heart. You know, don't, don't try to hide it, just be open about it, just be real. In verse 15, he says, worldly wisdom, is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Do you see the worldly wisdom as taught by demons? The doctrines changing the purity of certain persons. Purity is powerful. Look at what verse 17 says. But wisdom from heaven but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Amen. Wow! <laughs> Yo, if you really want to be wise in this life, wisdom from heaven is first of all pure. Sometimes this is how we walk. This is our standard. How can I get close to the gray before I'm in the darkness? So we tiptoe. And then we have friends that say, bro, that's demonic. That's unspiritual. That's not pure. The gray area isn't pure. This is how we feel. That we think, man, if I can only take a step into the darkness, yeah. I'm going to feel this. This is what I'm going to feel. I'm going to be riding on that shark. When I was younger, we, we went to Disney or wherever they had Jaws. I was like five. My parents were cruel, man. <laughs> they put a little five-year-old in Jaws. I knew it was a fake shark. I knew it. I held on to my sister. The shark came one way, I was like, ah. The shark came another way, I was like, ah. I remember this vividly. I held on to my sister crying all the way until it was done. You know, this is how we are when we do feel the pains of sin. We start off like this. We think like this. Because of our impure thoughts. The unspiritual acts. When people say, bro, is it cool if I, if I date a non-Christian? <laughs> She's fired up. She's gorgeous. Some people, some, some sisters leave the church because of a relationship. What's up with that? Jesus died for your sins. Do you remember, do you remember that guy Jesus? He rose from the dead. Then, this is then. Wisdom from heaven is first of all pure. If there's anything that we get, out of this lesson is that being wise means being pure. Yeah. 
Not only my heart, but my mind. Let me talk about it. <laughs> Principle number five. It says four, but it's five. A pure response daily. Last passage we'll look at, 2 Corinthians 11. Let's pray. 